All right, well, welcome to the afternoon sessions. Okay, our next spe uh, speaker is Shannon Armstrong, um, who is an attorney in Portland, Oregon. And her firm represented the residence group in a, a dispute that really has um, caught the public's attention in the continuing care world. The dispute was between Rogue Valley Manor and Pacific Retirement Services. This is a not-for-profit CCRC Rogue Valley Manor, and really the flagship of the um, Pacific Retirement Services Network of CCRCs, and then a, a very, very successful CCRC uh, by everyone's um, standards. And Pacific Retirement Services has also been quite successful, the uh, organization that um, serves as a um, sort of a de facto uh, parent organization. The corporate structure is quite a, a challenging structure for somebody who just comes to look at that type of an industry for the first time. And so part of the challenge that the law firm had when the residents asked uh, to be represented by them was learning all about the industry. And that's how I happened to get to know Shannon Armstrong. One time she called me to talk to me about the industry and I was in my car and so as I was driving through the mountains, uh, we had this conversation, um, and fortunately, I think I was in mountains that allow you to have telephone conversations in your car. Uh, but the case just resolved with a settlement. And this, all of the, what's fascinating about this case, aside from the result, aside from, aside from the fact that it resolved successfully and relatively quickly, um, was that the entire process has been quite public. Um, all of the meetings between the residents and their attorneys, um, when they're discussing the planning of what happens next, was videotaped, video conference, and provided to the residents, and is available to this day online. But even more amazing, the meetings between the PRS attorneys and the residents, uh, one major set of meetings is also online. And so you have their perspective on the issues before the settlement occurred. And I think that that very fact, that openness that I'm sure was dictated by consultation with the attorneys and the residents on that side of the case, has really allowed all of us to benefit from that um, history. And that's why we have Shannon Armstrong here today. Pearson for inviting me here today. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and thank you to the law school for also hosting I think this really important conference. Uh, there's a few folks here who advised our litigation along the way and uh, those of you know who you are, the steering committee. On behalf of the steering committee I want to thank all of you who provided some insight into some of the legal issues and gave guidance along the way. Uh, one definite challenge in this case is that we were communicating with a large number of people. <laughs> so one sort of fun anecdote that I like to tell is I organize my emails according to a case that I'm working on. And we were hired in this case in September. And at last count, just in my received emails, not my sent emails, I had over 4,000 emails <laughs> for this case in uh, about six months. Those are internal and external emails. So there's just a, a huge amount of communication that was going on, uh, both you know, within our legal team and with the residents at Rogue Valley Manor, with the other side, with all of the different parties, with the community at large. So uh, my presentation today, I, I wanted to give some of the background of Rogue Valley Manor and PRS and, and of the dispute. And then I wanted to talk about uh, four different areas. And those are the development of our legal theories, some of the unique management aspects of this case uh, from a law firm perspective, the, the period of negotiations and then the settlement that we were able to achieve, and then finally, what I think were some of the keys to our success uh, in this dispute. So to start with some of the background, uh, Professor Pearson discussed briefly sort of the parties and their relationships. Uh, our firm was approached in September 2012 but that was not when this dispute began. Um, the current organizational structure between Rogue Valley Manor and PRS was created in 1991. Rogue Valley Manor at that time was a standalone CCRC, and the president of Rogue Valley Manor decided to create its own management company uh, because they were also involved in some other low-income housing projects and other business interests. 
And so Rogue Valley Manor actually created Pacific Retirement Services. It basically created its own parent company, in effect. Uh, but at that time, PRS and Rogue Valley Manor were basically one and the same. They, they were run by the same people. They were just wearing different hats. PRS then, over the next 30 years or so, um, expanded dramatically, uh, moved beyond Medford, moved beyond just Rogue Valley Manor. Manor, the Manor and PRS both continue to flourish. They're both very successful organizations. But the focus of PRS was no longer just on Rogue Valley Manor and Rogue Valley Manor's success. And I think that's when some of the problems from, from my client's perspective began. In, I believe it was 2007, the CEO of PRS was, uh, who had also actually been the individual who had started PRS, had, had sort of spearheaded this effort was fired uh, amid allegations of some mismanagement. He was paid a very large severance package, which sort of raised some eyebrows in the community. And the Rogue Valley Manor Board, which was a, it was an independent board. It was a, um, mostly community members, uh, but it was also had a very high PRS influence. Many folks that were on the PRS board were also on the Rogue Valley Manor Board. And uh, the Rogue Valley Manor Board had been historically pretty quiet but then some questions started coming about. Some of the work that uh, Buzz Gittleson actually did uh, with regards to the Centennial transaction, which was a, a development of a golf course community nearby that was done together with Rogue Valley Manor and Pacific Retirement Services. Many of the residents had questions about that transaction, especially when it failed. Uh, so the Rogue Valley Manor Board began asking more questions, hired an outside lawyer, started an investigation, this was in about 2011, started negotiations with Pacific Retirement Services uh, with their goal basically being for separation from PRS. They no longer felt that, uh, that they had the same incentives, so they wanted separation. Uh, those negotiations were, were unsuccessful. Uh, they, things became, I think, I wasn't involved yet, but things I think became sort of tense around the issue and resulted in the Rogue Valley Manor Board by filing a lawsuit against Pacific Retirement Services, asking it to be expelled as the sole corporate member of Rogue Valley Manor. So when the organizational structure was created, uh, Rogue Valley Manor was a nonprofit entity and its sole member was PRS. This is a common structure in many healthcare type organizations. Um, so the Rogue Valley Manor Board fire, uh, filed a lawsuit, uh, asked for a temporary restraining order because the point of the temporary restraining order was asking that they not be fired because they said, okay, as soon as we file, file this lawsuit, we're going to get kicked off the board. Uh, the judge denied the TRO, and then PRS fired seven of the nine board members, all of the independent, all of the board members that were not also PRS board members. So seven of the nine were fired. Uh, also, at the same time, fired the executive director for apparent acts of disloyalty. And this really, I think, is what created the firestorm from the perspective of the residents. Uh, the executive director had been beloved, uh, a great manager, and a great person. And this really, to put it bluntly, pissed off a lot of the residents. <laughs> so they decided they needed to take their own legal action. So they hired our firm. We became involved in September 2012. And the, the thing that was interesting was who we were hired by. The Residence Council had decided, I think, very, very smart, um, a lot of foresight and idea. They created a litigation steering committee. So under their guidance, the, the head of the Residence Council, and I believe the outgoing president of the Residence Council, created a committee of residents that they thought would be best served to serve on this committee. And these were in it an amazing group of men and women. They were uh, former accountants, CFOs, uh, COO, uh, engineers, <coughs> professors, uh, a former public school superintendent, really an impressive group of folks who were very public-minded, uh, put the interest of Rogue Valley Manor first, uh, and really were the reason I think we were successful by and large. So that group, was, that steering committee hired our law firm, and the first thing that we did was took a, our firm, just to give a little bit of background, we're a commercial litigation law firm, so what we do is litigate. We don't, we're not uh, business lawyers and that we're not negotiating contracts and doing things like that. When people hire us, it usually means you're gonna get sued if you're on the other side. Um, so we began putting together a lawsuit. 
And the first challenge with that was that this sort of situation, these sort of relationships with a parent organization, Rogue Valley Manor, and the residents, the, the middle there, Rogue Valley Manor, had been essentially disabled by the fact that its executive director had been fired and seven of its nine board members had been fired. So the two remaining board members were still on the PRS board, so basically Rogue Valley Manor couldn't make, in our view, decisions for itself. So the residents had to act. Um, and that was really one of the first difficult things in looking at the legal theories, was a lot of the legal theories would be legal theories that could be brought on behalf of Rogue Valley Manor, but couldn't necessarily be brought on behalf of the residents. And that was a, a very large challenge, was figuring out what claims do we have that our clients actually have standing to pursue. So um, to explain for the non-lawyers in the crowd, standing is basically the legal right to be able to bring a claim. So just because someone's rights, you know, just because someone who isn't involved in a transaction's rights have been impacted doesn't mean necessarily that person can bring a lawsuit if they aren't the right person to do it, basically. So during this time period, we made, made uh, several very important, I think, strategic decisions. Um, we looked at the potential of filing a derivative lawsuit, and a derivative lawsuit is basically bringing a lawsuit uh, on behalf of somebody else. So what we were looking at doing is, okay, as the residents, can we bring a lawsuit actually on behalf of Rogue Valley Manor? Uh, we quickly found that the law was really against us nationwide on that issue. There haven't been any origin cases on that, but nationwide it wasn't looking good. We also looked at whether or not we could bring a derivative lawsuit on behalf of the former directors that had been fired. I think that we had a fairly okay shot at being able to do that under the Oregon nonprofit law, but it was still going to be an uphill battle. Um, we also looked at proceeding through the Attorney General. In Oregon, the Department of Justice uh, basically is the organization that does have standing to enforce actions against nonprofits. So we knew that at least we had a group there that had standing to bring a lawsuit if something had happened. On the other hand, you know, we we're dealing with a state agency that is uh, just like California, overburdened, understaffed. It would take a lot of time, a lot of resources, uh, and we weren't sure what rights as residents we would have to really um, drive that litigation. So we continued to work with the Department of Justice throughout our lawsuit, but we did not, they did not intervene, they did not take any formal action. We also considered a federal lawsuit. So we looked very carefully at uh, what federal claims we might have. We were in Jackson County uh, in Medford, Oregon, which we didn't perceive to be a great county uh, for filing a state the state court complaint. Uh, we thought federal court would be a better place to be. We couldn't find any clear jurisdictional hook for that either. Uh, so I'm just going through everything we went through that we rejected <laughs> to get to what we actually ended up choosing. Uh, we also looked at intervening in the case that had been filed by the Rogue Valley Manor Board. So as, as I mentioned earlier, the Rogue Valley Manor Board had filed a lawsuit against PRS and the board was fired. But that lawsuit, that lawsuit still sort of existed. It was still there. And PRS actually then filed a counterclaim in that suit. And we thought, okay, well, is that, our, is that our play? Do we try to intervene in that lawsuit? We ultimately rejected that idea um, because it really wasn't our lawsuit. We didn't think we could really control what happened very well in that lawsuit. Although we still had some fears over if there was an adverse judgment, would that completely kill whatever legal action we were taking? The final uh, thing that we looked at and ended up rejecting was uh, the management services agreement between Rogue Valley Manor and PRS contained an arbitration clause. And so we thought about whether or not we could get into arbitration rather than uh, into filing a court action, whether derivatively as residents we could assert some sort of third party right under the arbitration clause. We ended up rejecting that, that idea as well. So what we decided our best, our best shot was, was on filing a class action lawsuit, uh, direct claims on behalf of the residents. It was sort of the cleanest approach and the approach we thought had the greatest possibility for um, a big money damages award, which wasn't necessarily what our clients were interested in, uh, as I'll get into in a little bit here, but was definitely what we thought might motivate the other side to be reasonable about settlement. So the over this is maybe a two month process after we were hired as we did all of this research, had meetings, uh, investigated, did all of this. We, we, the legal theory that we developed was basically summarized in one sentence is that uh, Pacific, Pacific Retirement Services was using Rogue Valley Manor as a profit center by charging fees in excess of its costs to fund PRS and its affiliated organizations. Uh, we thought that the facts back that up. We still do think the facts back that up. 
uh, and we thought that that violated, we had, we had colorable claims uh, in many different ways for that sort of activity. And I'll describe briefly here are the claims that we did make. Uh, so the 60-day period, you know, we did research investigation, and we actually drafted a complaint during this time too, drafted our class action complaint. Uh, the first claim, and perhaps the most powerful, was our claim for elder financial abuse. Uh, this is an important claim because in Oregon, you know, you get trouble damages, so your damages basically get tripled, uh, which is uh, definitely uh, a nice thing for a plaintiff in a lawsuit to have in their pocket. And our theory for that claim was that uh, PRS had wrongfully appropriated money from plaintiffs through the collection of fees for management-related services that were in excess of the cost of the services provided to RBM. So the theory behind this was that PRS had made statements uh, in its tax filings and statements through Rogue Valley Manor and its residence and care contracts that it would charge at the cost of its services. And by not doing so, it basically had um, acted fraudulently, and that was the hook to be able to prove that there was a wrongful appropriation of monies from, from the residents at Rogue Valley Manor. The really great thing for us about the elder abuse statute was, one, the trouble damages, and two, it provides for very broad equitable relief. So what we were dealing with here was a situation where our clients weren't that interested in recovering some huge sum. That, that wasn't their goal. Their goal was to change the structure of Rogue Valley Manor to protect it from, they, from the parent organization. They felt like the, the CCRC where they were living was actually being victimized basically by its parent organization. It was funding uh, that Rogue Valley Manor was, funds were being taken from Rogue Valley Manor, resources were being taken from Rogue Valley Manor, and being used to fund PRS losses elsewhere. And we were really excited about the elder abuse statute because it provided these broad equitable remedies, including under the statute, the removal of anyone who was found to have committed the abuse under the judge's discretion. So this was what we thought was our one shot at getting separation was under this statute, under the equitable relief that the court could order under the statute. It was definitely a long shot, but it was the only shot we had legally, we thought, to get separation. Uh, the other theories, I'll go over them briefly, that we asserted were a breach of fiduciary duty claim, an unlawful trade practices uh, and misrepresentation claim, a breach of contract claim, and an intentional interference with contractual relations claim. Just briefly, the, the breach of contract claim is a little bit interesting because the theory that we proceeded on was that the residents were third-party beneficiaries of the Articles of Incorporation of the statute, or of the, of the organization. So when Rogue Valley Manor um, and PRS were both sort of, things changed in 1991 with their relationship, um, the Articles of Incorporation made clear that the purpose of Rogue Valley Manor as a nonprofit organization was to benefit its residents. So our theory was that as third party beneficiaries of that contract, because there is case law to support the fact that Articles of Incorporation as well as bylaws are actually enforceable contracts, that our clients were third party beneficiaries of that contract and by, uh, by taking action that did not benefit our clients, but instead benefited PRS losses elsewhere, uh, there was a breach, of, a breach of contract. So that was sort of an interesting theory that um, we haven't seen a lot of, but I think we were, we, we had some good arguments to make there. We were excited to, to, to fight about that when I got to it. So uh, sort of what we did early on, as I described, is we spent the 60 days of, um, investigation, drafting a complaint. During this time, we had sort of a, a two-pronged approach. We were also in negotiations. So the interesting thing about the negotiations was that from the very beginning, PRS made clear that separation was off the table. It wouldn't be a negotiating point. It would not be something they discussed. It was absolutely a non-starter with them. And that sort of, I think, it came about from the negotiations with the Rogue Valley Manor Board before they were all fired. So we knew that that was the case, that, that PRS was not going to allow us to negotiate a separation. Uh, we also knew one major concern of our clients that was actually mentioned by Buzz earlier is uh, they were really fearful of retaliation by PRS uh, for participating in this lawsuit. So early on, sort of the, the boundaries, I guess I'd put it, for the negotiation were number one, that we would talk about separation, and number two, that PRS agreed that there could be no retaliation in any way against any residents uh, because of this lawsuit. So uh, how the negotiations went as far as process goes is the, the first negotiation 
was just lawyers to lawyers, just sort of, we went in and made our case to the PRS lawyers about what it was that we wanted. We explained what our legal theories were, which is I think why it really paid to do that legal research and, um, and spend all that time early on really figuring out what our theories were, uh, and then explained what our negotiating goals were. And this was another really important part of the litigation is that our steering committee uh, on their own came up with their negotiating goals at the very beginning and said, this is what we want. And the negotiating goals were, they wanted an independent Rogue Valley Man board. Uh, all of these were, you know, they, they were flexible. They were ideas that needed to be implemented. You needed to think of different ways to make it work. But they were general guidelines that they wanted the negotiations to focus on. So uh, an independent Rogue Valley Manor board. They wanted the fired executive director to be returned. This was very important. They also wanted the executive director position to report to Pacific Retirement Services, or to report to Rogue Valley Manor instead of Pacific Retirement Services. They wanted fair fees in the future. They didn't feel like the fee structure was fair. They wanted uh, something we've also heard about today, a financial firewall between PRS and RBM. They wanted the RBM foundation to be protected. Uh, they wanted it to be, uh, be uh, run by Rogue Valley Manor Board and not PRS. And then the final was they wanted damages for past misconduct. We made very clear that the most important issues were the return of the executive director and an independent Rogue Valley Manor Board uh, and a structure for getting fair fees in the future. We made very clear that although our lawsuit was asking for $30 million in damages, that's not what we were most interested in. We were most interested in a change in the governance structure that would protect Rogue Valley Manor for a long time. Our, our client said, I can't count the amount of, amount of times uh, members of the steering committee said to me, you know, what we really need to be concerned about is what Rogue Valley Manor is gonna look like in 40 years. Uh, that was by far their most important concern. It wasn't what their fees were going to be next year. It was what the, what the next generation of residents, uh, what they were going to have to put up with. So um, over the next 60 days, we had several negotiation sessions. First was just lawyers. The next set of negotiations, we brought along uh, members of the PRS board and also members of our steering committee. Uh, they weren't very effective. We decided to enter into a formal mediation period where we hired a formal mediator. Um, we had some really interesting negotiations regarding the confidentiality of that mediation. PRS wanted the mediation to be fully confidential even after it happened. We explained that we had to really report to the larger resident group that there's no way to make that confidential. So we could agree to confidentiality during the time of mediation, but there was absolutely no way that we could agree to confidentiality after the fact. If the larger, our clients were the steering committee, but if the larger group wasn't fully informed about what had happened during the negotiations, there was no way they could make an informed decision about whether or not they wanted to file their class action complaint. So we were able to be successful in getting the confidentiality provision to just apply during the actual period of mediation, sort of a silent period, and then afterwards we're free to talk about whatever happened. Um, so we had a formal mediation. We actually had two sessions. One interesting thing that we were able to do was uh, negotiate the PRS turning over some of its financial records. Uh, we very shortly after that hired two forensic accountants to review the financial records. The preliminary conclusions of our forensic accountants were that what we had thought had been happening, which was basically that PRS was charging, was taking money that had come in through Rogue Valley Manor fees and using it to sustain their losses elsewhere, was clearly what had been going on. The organization was sustaining losses and all of these other operations it wasn't sustaining losses at our facility, so it was pretty clear where the money was coming from to, to fund those losses. Um, so that was useful to be able to get that information from PRS. We really appreciated actually that gesture from them of showing that, hey, we're trying to be more transparent because that had been a problem throughout the litigation was that we had been concerned about a lack of transparency from the parent organization. So I think that was actually really helpful, not just substantively, but procedurally and uh, in perception by my client group. Um, so we had two full mediation sessions with the mediator. Uh, we, at that point, were not very sure that we were going to be able to come up with something that worked. We started polishing our complaint, getting it ready to be filed. We went back to the residents and did a, a presentation explaining what the lawsuit would look like, what the timeline would look like, what the budget would be, what sort of fundraising we needed to do. Uh, all of those things, we were very upfront with all of it. 
with the client group. Um, and we took a vote, not a paper vote, but a vote by hands asking who wanted to go back to, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the question was that was posed, but I think it was basically who was in favor of filing the lawsuit in light of what, you know, they had been, what had been explained about where the negotiations currently were. It was overwhelmingly in support of filing the lawsuit. Um, we received both votes by hand. As Professor Pearson mentioned, all of these presentations were televised to the entire community through their, I don't know how they do it, but they do it. <laughs> uh, so we had people that were emailing in votes to me. Uh, it's part of the 4,000 emails where uh, probably 100 or so votes from folks that weren't actually attending our meeting that voted on, on whether or not to pursue litigation. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't unanimous, but it was at least over 80%, I would say, voted in favor. Um, so we polished our complaint and gave our 30-day notice on November 21st. Uh, under Oregon law, you have to give 30 days notice before you file a class action complaint seeking damages. So we did that on November 21st. And at the same time, we uh, deployed a, an additional strategy, which ended up being what was successful here. And that was some direct negotiations with the folks that really had pre-existing personal relationships. I think that was really the key to our success here. We had several individuals who were members of the steering committee who had known members of the PRS board for a long time. And uh, I think in general, trust had broken down between the two organizations, and that's what you know we're trying to build back now. Uh, but those individuals who had known each other, they still trusted each other. And they managed to set up some small group negotiations face-to-face, -face, just I think like three members of the PRS board and a couple members of the steering committee. And on December 21st, uh, we did not file our complaint. Instead, we entered into a, a tentative letter of intent to settle the lawsuit, uh, inform the residents that this is what the steering committee was doing. And uh, then over the next six weeks or so, the, the steering committee, PRS, uh, some folk, the folks at RBM, and the lawyers all worked very hard to get this all, actually, this deal inked. It was, it was a lot of work. I can't count the number of drafts that went back and forth between, between the parties. Uh, at this point, it became clear that Rogue Valley Manor also needed to be a party to the settlement agreement. So while the dispute had been between the, the residents and PRS, since many of the settlement provisions were going to affect Rogue Valley Manor, they needed to be a party. So they were sort of had to come out of the woodwork and become involved in, in some of the, the, um, the final negotiations. The, the major presented, uh, provisions of our settlement, which I think are included in your materials, our actual settlement agreement, but the major provisions were that we had what we considered to be an independent Rogue Valley Manor board. There would be no PRS members, two resident members that were selected by the, that would be selected by the residence council. Those um, resident directors could not be removed by anyone other than the residence council. We had seven, then seven community directors that would be chosen by initially a nominating committee that was consisted, that was comprised of uh, three folks from the manor and three folks from PRS. They'd get together and find actually six community members because one one board member was going to stick around. The, the neutral board member from earlier was going to stick around, and. Um, and those community board members, which to me this was the one of the most important points, those board members could not be fired. It had to be for cause, and cause was defined is defined in the agreement, uh, in my view, very narrowly. And so, what we were trying to avoid here is what had happened in the summer ever happening again. PRS could, if RBM, if the RBM board had issues, started asking questions, started asking uncomfortable questions, started making uncomfortable demands, the response could not be, "Well, you're all fired." Uh, that was basically taken off the table. The other important um, points of the, of the settlement agreement were that the executive director position would be a dual reporting position. So previously, uh, it had been a PRS employee. It was going to continue as a PRS employee, but the new executive director, a woman by the name of Sarah Smith, who seems to be doing a marvelous job so far, is um, she reports both to the Rogue Valley Manor Board and to PRS. Her review, her compensation, uh, the selection of any future executive director, that would be done jointly with PRS and with the Rogue Valley Man Board. The other uh, issues that our settlement covered, you know, big issues were a cap on management fees through the end of the current management services agreement, so through 2015, 
management fees are capped at 2.5 million basically. So that's going to result in a savings of approximately half a million dollars a year for the residents over the next three years. And they also get back an immediate $400,000 credit that I think is showing up like on our April statements um, for uh, the redu basically demonstrating the reduction in the fees that are being paid to PRS. Uh, we did not get any damages for past misconduct. As I described earlier, that was never really a goal of our negotiation. It would have been a goal of our litigation. Um, but it wasn't really a goal of our negotiation. But two troublesome property uh, issues with the, the Crest Park development and the Centennial Golf Course, uh, the settlement ag agreement addresses both of those issues. Um, you can read the details or we can talk more about it. They get a little complex, but we're trying to, we try to find a way to sort of reset those issues in a way that would be fair to both parties. Uh, we have a financial firewall. Uh, RVM will be protected in the event of PRS bankruptcy. The Rogue Valley Manor Foundation is now controlled by the newly independent Rogue Valley Manor Board, and uh, we got reimbursement of the of the steering committee's or the residents' legal fees up to three hundred thousand dollars. So that was the other really successful thing. That was actually quite a bit of work to be able to get that for the for the um, for the residents. So. Oh, finally, the most important thing, I almost forgot, I, I saw Professor Pearson looking at me, is that we had an admission in the settlement agreement that PRS has a fiduciary duty to Rogue Valley Manor. And the reason why this is so important is because right now there's a little bit of a hole, I call it a hole in the law. Uh, Nonprofit law doesn't require that sole members have fiduciary duties to their organizations. So the situation we have now of PRS being the sole member of Rogue Valley Manor, uh, so typically, in a nonprofit organization, the directors have a fiduciary duty, right, to the organization. Uh, but the member, in this case, the member is controlling everything. And the member, under the nonprofit law, had no fiduciary duty to the organization. Now, we think under Oregon law, there would be a good sort of common law argument for why that fiduciary duty existed, but it definitely was not, um, there were no cases that made that crystal clear. Uh, I was very hopeful that we'd be able to win that and the motion to dismiss that was, that was surely going to come. Uh, but being able to get that now provides so much certainty for the residents going forward, knowing that PRS has admitted that it and has undertaken actual fiduciary obligations to Rogue Valley Manor uh, is hugely important. So I, I had more, but I know that some of you might have questions. So I wanted to pause briefly and see if anyone had questions now or whether I should continue. See a question in the back? Yeah, how was how was uh, current entity deriving funds from Rogue Valley Manor apart from the National Business Contract? The the question was how the the parent company, Pacific Retirement Services, was deriving funds from Rogue Valley Manor. And um, what it was whether it was just from the management agreement or from something else apart from the management. From the management. The fees were, um, well, there, there were going to be arguments that the fees they were taking were in excess of the management services agreement. Their argument would be we were charging the fees that we were due under the management services agreement. However, the management services agreement, in our view, um, was not, was basically not a fair agreement, was not one that was negotiated at arm's length. Uh, it, PRS was charging fees um, that were in excess of, we believe, what the market standard would be. And most importantly, PRS had made admissions when it was created that we would be charging fees at cost. And it was very clear that they weren't charging fees at cost. They were charging fees much in excess of cost. So the way it worked in the management services agreement, though, to be clear, is that there was sort of a base management fee, which was a percentage of gross operating revenue. And then there were also direct service fees that were added on later, that were accounting fees, IT fees, things like that, that were added on. <coughs> um, there wasn't um, consistency with how those fees were treated with our organization versus other organizations, and that was that was a, a large part of our contention was that we were being treated um, adversely in comparison to the other PRS CCRCs. Yes? At the end of the current contract, can Rogue Valley actually the question was, is at the end of the current contract, can Rogue Valley Manor di divorce the current um, management company? I think the answer is no, and but it's complicated. 
Uh, a lot of it has to do with some really complicated tax issues that I'm still trying to get my head around. Uh, there's this idea of the supported supporting organization structure. And PRS is a supporting organization, and Rogue Valley Manor is the supported organization. Uh, at the very least, there'd have to be some significant restructuring of the tax of the tax structure for it to work. So that, that's that's another part of the issue here was, okay, well, can we even is separation should it even be a goal if we can't really accomplish it? Yes. It is absolutely, the question was, I'm sorry, was uh, what is left of PRS being the sole member as a result of the settlement? Nothing about that relationship has changed. PRS is still the sole member. However, its powers under the sole membership are limited. Well, that's, that's really what I was after. It's so limited that uh, it's a little bit difficult to see that there's much less other than the cause factor. Well, the RBM article set forth eight or nine factors, which I don't have memorized, but are all the powers that the sole member has over the over the um, over Rogue Valley Manor, and they don't just include the appointment of the of the members of the board. They also include um, power over long term financing, long term strategic planning. Um, any mergers, acquisitions, dissolutions. Uh, there's very broad corporate power. And this is in the uh, contract? Uh, no. Okay, so the question was, is, is where were those powers, where is that coming from? And another sort of interesting thing about the case is that we were working with a, a variety of different documents that mattered. We had the management services agreement between Rogue Valley Manor and Pacific Retirement Services. We also had the Articles of Incorporation for Rogue Valley Manor. We also had the, um, the, the application for its nonprofit status for Pacific Retirement Services. We also have the bylaws for the organizations. And all of these documents together, we rely on all of them basically to make our arguments in the complaint. They all provide something a little different. Uh, so that's where the, the powers that PRS still has are in the Rogue Valley Manor bylaws which as part of the settlement agreement, to be clear, had to be amended to be consistent with the settlement agreement, which has happened. Yes, in the middle. Yes. The sole member of tax issue, my understanding is that um, your firm retained two independent outside tax counsels, and they reported back that it wasn't absolutely essential, but uh, there existed a sole member. And I further understand from listening to your colleague markets that um, the proposition was was made that your independent tax council should meet with PRS's independent tax council and figure out what's what and what's real. Mm -hmm. And they refused to meet. What's your take on all of that? The, the question was regards to the advice we received from independent tax council regarding the tax structure, what PRS was and wasn't able to do uh, as the supporting organization. Uh, and also asked regarding uh, was explained in my colleague Dave Markwood's presentation, which are available for anybody who's interested to see on the internet, uh, regarding our offer to have the sort of the two tax experts get together in a room and figure out why we couldn't agree on this. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, we did hire we hired one tax counsel. Um, we received an opinion that basically um, to narrow the issue a little bit wasn't that PRS wasn't that PRS um, couldn't be the sole member or had to be the sole member. What the tax council was looking at more specifically was how much, as the sole member, how much power does PRS have to maintain to be able to maintain that tax structure? So how much power in the settlement, uh, how much power could we get them to give away and still have them meet their tax obligations under their, under their uh, how they're organized? So, According to our tax council, uh, they could do more than what they were saying they could. And according to their count tax council, they had very little leeway. Uh, at the end, so to give an example, at the beginning, uh, their position was that uh, they had to appoint everybody on the board and that they had absolute discretion as to when someone's fired. And they said that was according to tax council. 
well, our settlement agreement provides that we have two residents on the board and also provides that they can't be fired for any reason uh, by PRS and also provides that PRS can't file the community members other than for cause. So I think our interpretation won out, although it was never really explicitly dealt with. Yes? Jim, when you started, you mentioned that really a catalyst, one of the most important points, was the rehiring of the executive director, mm -hmm. Kevin DeFault. And you didn't mention what happened to that. I'd like to know what happened to that and why did it happen? So the, the question was uh, that one of our most important negotiating goals at the beginning was getting Kevin McLaughlin, the executive director, rehired. And what happened with that in the settlement process and where we are now? And this was actually the most difficult issue that we dealt with, I think, in the entire, in the entire settlement process. Uh, as I described earlier, Kevin was a much beloved, very effective, very successful, longtime administrator at Rogue Valley Manor. Uh, and his firing was a blow to the entire community, one that um, I still think they haven't quite got over. Uh, however, during our negotiations, during our mediations and our direct negotiations, it became clear that there was absolutely no way, uh, it was a line in the sand for PRS, that there was no way that Kevin would be able to come back. Uh, and that was a, a really difficult call for our clients to decide whether or not that meant that we filed our $30 million class action lawsuit, or in light of the fact that PRS was maybe willing to move on some of these other issues, was that enough? And I think sort of how it came down was in that 30-day uh, period I mentioned earlier, after we gave notice of our intent to file the class action lawsuit and when the case became settled, uh, and they had the face-to-face -face negotiations, I think having that part of it be client-led was really important because the steering committee was able to come to the conclusion that, okay, maybe we are able to get enough, you know, we hate losing Kevin. That was definitely the emotional part of the case for my clients. Uh, was what had happened to what many of them considered to be their very good friend. Uh, but they were able to see, this is sort of looking at the long term that I mentioned earlier, that 40 years from now, what they're able to do now would affect Rogue Valley Manor 40 years from now. And that was the more important goal. So it was a tough call. I think that there's still some folks at the manor that are upset that, that the steering committee was willing to give it up. Yes, and just to, to, to add to that, uh, as Professor Pearson just mentioned, uh, Kevin does have a, a separate, uh, has legal counsel and is pursuing claims independently right now, so, yes. was uh, regarding the, the importance of the face-to-face -face negotiations with, with folks that had pre-existing relationships and really where would we have been without that. Uh, I think it's hard to say because Medford's a small community, although many, most of the Rogue Valley Manor residents uh, come from out of state from what I understand. They're still really long, it's a small community, small business community. Folks have really long-standing relationships there. So the entire case was sort of within that context of folks that had long-standing relationships. Um, so I think it's it's really difficult to take it out of that context to figure out how things would have happened differently. Uh, I think it was important in this case that those, that those people were able to rely on those relationships. But I think maybe the bigger point too that I didn't make is that that was important at the end, but I don't think any of that would, would have happened if we didn't go through the process we went through. Um, so I have just really quickly sort of the list of the reasons that, why I think that we were successful that I can just go through really quick that I think sort of bring this all together. And in general, I think we were successful because we had a really great com uh, combination of transparency, being aggressive when necessary, but also being reasonable in, in light of the fact that litigation is expensive, it's risky, it takes a long time. Uh, as far as being transparent, um, the steering committee was transparent with residents from the beginning. They gave weekly reports um, that the fundraising sort of arm of the steering committee, a, a gentleman by the name of John Gerling, who really spearheaded much of this, gave uh, reports on the fundraising as they went along, said what they had spent money on, 
they said this is what we're going to do. There was a website run by one of the gentlemen at the facility, Skip Ross, who he collected all of the information about the case, anything that had been filed, all of these memos that were going back and forth from PRS and Rogue Valley Manor and all these sort of nasty grams that were going back and forth. They're all on the website, so people were able to follow along that way. But we really had a very collaborative, dedicated steering committee that spent many, many hours a week working on this. I think that was one of the most important things, if not the most important thing. Other uh, really important, I think, takeaway was that our steering committee had very clear negotiating goals from the beginning. They weren't just litigating just because it was something to do. There were a few things that they really wanted, and they identified what those things were, and they prioritized what the most important things were and what the least important things were. And they were clear with PRS from the beginning about what those things were. There's no hiding the ball about what our goals were. Uh, the other things that I think were important to our success was that uh, the aggressive and transparent fundraising. Uh, John Gerling was able to raise about a quarter million dollars very, very quickly. And we were able to share that with PRS in our first negotiation, that our, our residents had already raised a quarter of a million dollars for the legal fees. That means something. It means something when you show a group of folks that are that dedicated um, and that resourceful. And then just finally, I think the other really important fact that we had uh, that helped us out was we combined sort of a, a, what I think is a really reasonable negotiating strategy. We were definitely willing to negotiate. We always had clear negotiating goals, but we also had a very aggressive litigation strategy. We didn't wait around to figure out what our legal claims were. We didn't wait around to figure out what our theories would be. We spent two months drafting what I think is a very strong complaint. Um, we gave the complaint to the other side during mediation so they could see it. Uh, we were ready to file. We were ready to send document requests on the day we filed our lawsuit. We were ready to take depositions within 30 days of filing. Uh, it was a very aggressive litigation strategy combined with being very reasonable, I think, in negotiations. So I think I'm done.